Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. We begin with Allah's blessed name. We praise Him and we glorify Him as He ought to be praised and glorified. And we pray for peace and for blessings on all His noble messengers, and in particular on the last of them all, the blessed Prophet Muhammad. Sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam, as we greet you with assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and with Ramadan Kareem on this the 25th day of the blessed month of Ramadan. And we thank Allah. We thank Allah. We can never stop thanking Him for having given us blessed Ramadan. And we thank him even more for having given us this blessed Quran in blessed Ramadan. And when Ramadan comes, it's the month of the Quran. And when, when Ramadan goes, we grieve, we grieve for Ramadan. MashaAllah for this Ummah, MashaAllah. We are so lucky that we have the blessed month of Ramadan. And uh, we were speaking about Dajjal and time and the Jasad. And uh, about that remarkable prophecy of Akhir Zaman concerning the corruption of the system of time that Allah has given. Allah says in the Quran that He's given us the moon and the stages of growth and decline of the moon. That you might use the moon for the measurement of time and for counting the years. So we don't use the sun. We do not use the solar year for the measurement of time. You use the solar year for other things, but not for the measurement of time and for counting the years. It's when we depart from the solar year, when we, sorry, when we depart from the lunar year and Dajjal embraces us with the solar time, it is then that this prophecy is fulfilled, that a whole year will pass like a month because time will move faster and faster. You know the hadith. And if you still perceive time moving faster and faster, even though you are reciting the Quran to complete the whole Quran in one month, and you are doing it in accordance with the proper ajza, plural of juz, each juz for the particular day, you are not chopping the Quran into bits and pieces and you still perceive time moving faster, be patient. Keep on, keep on making the khatam of the Qur'an month after month until eventually, inshallah, your heart will once again beat in harmony with the rest of Allah's creation. Then you will enjoy life. Otherwise, when time is moving faster and faster, you're going to dance to every tune that Dajjal plays. That's right. So now then, on this, the 25th day, as we approach the end of Ramadan, notice that in the sky, the moon will eventually disappear from the evening sky and the night sky. And it's going to be a dark night. And it's going to be the stars which will take over from the moon. Have you noticed that? As the month is coming to an end. There are two reasons for this. The first reason, of course, is that when the sky is dark, it becomes more easy to recognize the new moon when she's born, the baby is born. And to watch the movement of the new moon as she grows, the baby grows, becomes an infant and a child. And then the second reason is 
as you have been reciting the Quran in accordance with the moon, and uh, the moon has been helping you to return to lunar time, and the moon has been teaching you so many things connected with the Quran. As the month comes to an end, and now the stars replace the moon, recitation of the Quran now begins to give way to study of the Quran. You cannot study the Quran unless you are first reciting the Quran. When I am no longer in this world, please teach this. Teach it to your children. Teach it to the young ones. You cannot study the Quran unless you are first reciting the Quran. And when you recite the Quran, it must be recited as it ought to be recited. And I have already taught that the Quran and the moon. Make dua that I may finish the book. In fact, the book was substantially finished last September in, um, in Mombasa. It was the month of um, Muharram. And the book was substantially finished. And between September last year and now, I just can't find the time to complete the finishing touches of the book. The Quran and the moon methodology for recitation of the Quran. So as the month is coming to an end, as Ramadan is now coming to an end, the message from the sky, as the moon disappears eventually and the dark night comes, and then starlight replaces moonlight in the sky, the message from the Quran is now the stars are taking over. And that's the ayah of the verse of Surah Al-Waqiyah that I recited yesterday. Oh, it's a lovely verse. A lovely verse. I love this ayah of the Quran. Ba'da'uzi billahi minash shaitanir rajim. Fala uksimu bimawaqi'in nujum. And Allah says, I take an oath. A kasam by the mawakim, the positions in which the stars are located. Wa innahu la kasamun law ta'alamun azim. And this is no ordinary oath. This is the mother of all oaths, kasam. Tremendously important. What? Is it he's talking about? I take an oath by the positions in which the stars are located. Here's the answer. Innahu la Quranun Karim Fi Kitabim Maknoon. This is a recitation. Quran means recitation. Which is Karim, which is noble and generous. And it is located in a kitab or a book which is protected. None can touch this book other than those who are pure. Pure. The heart being pure for Allah. Not that I, no, no, I can't do that. If I speak like that, my business will collapse. Oh, that heart is corrupted. <laughs> No, no, I can't talk like that. If I talk like that, they'll say I'm a terrorist. They put my name on a no-fly list. No, no, Sheikh. My business, my job is more important to me than Allah. <laughs> right? That's not a pure heart. So Allah is not talking about physical touch here. He's talking about penetrating the Quran, penetrating the Quran. So if your heart is not pure for Allah, you don't worship him with purity. You don't live for him. You're not prepared to die for him. You won't be able to penetrate even this much touching the surface of the Quran. That's the meaning of the ayah. It is mutashabiha. It is not mukhkara. This was what we did on the last occasion. That if you recite the Quran as it ought to be recited, number one, Time will move slower, deliciously slow. Number two, 
it prepares you now for Mawaki and Nujum, for studying the Quran, to see how the verses of the Quran are interconnected with each other. <clears throat> and my teacher, blessed memory, uh, Maulana Dr. Muhammad Fadl Rahman Ansari, the most abiding legacy of that great man and that great scholar was his methodology for the study of the Quran. And if you want to study that, you have to go to his two volume book, The Quranic Foundations and Structure of Muslim Society, in two volumes. The book has been translated to French. It's available in French now. The book has also been translated to Urdu, and it is available in the Urdu language now. And hopefully we'll have it tomorrow, we'll have it in Swahili, we'll have it in Malay, we'll have it in Farsi, we'll have it in German, we'll have it in Spanish and other languages. Good. And so now, as the month is coming to an end, it's the time to study the Quran. Allah says about the Quran that it is Tibyan and Likulli Shay, it explains all things. And so it must explain the strange world in which we live today. The most visible thing about the world today that is a universal phenomenon, the only one who cannot re recognize it are the summun bukmun for whom la ya'kirun, the dumb and the blind who cannot think. They are the only ones. They don't recognize it. What is it? That we live with universal facade. Everything is corrupted now. All around us there is corruption, including the food that we eat. The water that we drink. Yes, our plants, our animals, everything is being corrupted now. Around the world. Water, the rivers are all polluted now. What, is it possible that this universal facade around the world is by accident? Huh? Is it possible that the Quran would not have an explanation for the universal facade? The only people who don't see the universal facade is your Darul Ulum. I'm sorry I have to come back and again and again to them because I'm struggling. This is my mission in life for a new model of a Darul Ulum which has the capacity to think. Iqbal said, Dr. Muhammad Iqbal, the famous scholar, he said, this ummah stopped thinking 500 years ago. I could not understand him when I was a young man. But now in the winter years of my life, I realized that he was correct. What is the explanation of the universal facade, universal corruption all over us? political corruption, economic corruption, monetary corruption, educational corruption, religious corruption, fighting each other over peanuts, sectarianism. Hmm? There must be an explanation. And it has to be in the Quran. Because Allah says of the Quran that it is Tibian and the Kudlishai, meaning it explains all things. And this brings us to the other question that the rabbis posed. We had that question about the roof, and then we had the question about the young men and the cave, and then there was a question about the great traveler who traveled to the two ends of the land. We're not going to be able to complete the explanation today We'll just start it and then tomorrow we'll complete it, inshallah. I hope we can complete it tomorrow. But uh, this is the heart of Islamic eschatology. If someone is teaching Islamic eschatology, if someone has made some contribution to Islamic eschatology, ask, find out, what has he said 
about Gog and Magog. That is a crucial determining factor. Is this an eschatologist or is this a schoolboy? Hmm? Insofar as eschatology is concerned, go to them and see what have they written. If, have they written anything on Gog and Magog? Have they given any lectures on Gog and Magog? Have they spoken on the subject of Gog and Magog? What did they say on the subject? If they have any credentials in Achirozaman, in eschatology, this is what determines it, whether or not you have credentials. Because Gog and Magog is at the heart, the very heart of Islamic eschatology, together, of course, with al Masih al-Dajjal. And so the Quran is now responding to the question posed by the rabbis. And this is a question which only a prophet can answer. So Oxford University, sorry, you can't answer this question. Go and go home and sleep, you can't answer this question. And when Allah answered the question and put the answer in Surah al kaf he first repeated the question and then he gave the answer. And what was the question? وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنْ ذِي الْقَرْنَيْنِ And they questioned thee, O Muhammad والسلام, the great traveler, Zul Karnain. So is Zul Karnain a person? What does Zul Karnain mean? Zul Karnain is someone who possesses two Karn. So what is Karn? Karn. Karn has two meanings. Karn means a horn. Karn can also mean a generation, a people, an epoch, a time, an age. Hmm? So which of these two is correct? If the schoolboy insists, as he always insists, you no, know, it means the two horns, well, tell him, son, son, I don't have time to waste. Would you kindly leave me alone? Go your way and let me go ahead, <laughs> kindly. No need for any boxing gloves. Hmm? No, no. If you want to answer the question, what is Zulukar name? What is Karn? The place to go for the answer is not the Sorbonne or yeah, Harvard or Yale. It is the Quran. And when you go to the Quran to get the answer, you'll find that the Quran has always used the word Karn to mean this and never that. Never, never, never has the youth, the Quran uses the word karn to mean a horn, never. So when the Quran uses the word karn, in this instance, it has to be the same as all the rest of the Quran. That's elementary analysis. So Zul Karnain will be someone who impacts on two people who impacts on two ages, two epochs. Don't you ever, ever lose sight of this because you're going to be introduced now to the first one. And if you, you, you forget that there's a second one that is coming, well then go eat your biryani and go home and sleep. Mm. Remember, there are two. And what we are now going to get is an introduction to the first karn. And if you forget the second karn, which is to come, then you are still a schoolboy. Hmm? So what is that first karn? It is a karn in which we introduce to Rizal Karnain as someone who has faith in Allah and uh, who is given power by Allah, power to pursue whatever objective he chooses to pursue. And uh, this leader, this ruler, 
who has power and who has the capacity to pursue, uh, to utilize that power in pursuing whatever objective he chooses to pursue, now embarks on travel in two directions. He first travels in the direction, excuse me, of the setting of the sun. And then he travels in the direction of the rising of the sun. And on both occasions, he has to reach to the end of the land. The end meaning you can't go any further because there's water. But when he goes to this side of the end of the land, which it is a body of water which is dark and murky, and that's the Black Sea. So then the other side will have to be the Caspian Sea. So you're talking about that area where the Caucasus Mountains are located. That's enough for today. We are giving you now an introduction to the geography of the Quran in an attempt to study the subject of Zulkarnain. Thank you. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.